about three jetliners retire every day. Every day, three jetliners, including Saturdays and Sundays, three jetliners retire from service mm -hmm. and they're flown to death camps, to boneyards. <laughs> and it's odd, isn't it? Because we as a species fly this gorgeous aerospace technology and the best technology of a size which we can live in short of spacecraft. And we typically fly them at the rate of very roughly three per day to death camps and shred them. And then we wander into a forest like this, gather a bunch of sticks, and then find some metal spikes and we pound them together and set them on the ground, which is vulnerable because the ground is a fluid medium. And then we live in that. And then we go back to work the next day to shred another three jetliners. It doesn't make any sense. And if you were an extraterrestrial and you were looking down on this behavior for the first time, you'd see, okay, let's see, this is their finest aerospace technology. And they use it and then they fly to a death camp and they shred it. And then they wander off into a forest and gather a bunch of sticks and metal spikes and pound them together and make a home. And then they go back to work and shred their best aerospace technology. What kind of a species thinks like that? <laughs> Very uh -oh. alien, isn't it? That feeling of an alien landing in the woods, you know, a, a spaceship, right? With the lights. <laughs> I, I guess I've lost that perspective. It's so much home to me now that uh, the, the, the alien perspective has become alien to me. Let, let's head to the flight deck and let's get the cabin lights on so you can see better. And th this is not Boeing native, but so this is the service door for the galley. <laughs> and watch the first step. It's rather steep. This, by the way, is the guest lav. Just like a regular uh, airline toilet. I mean, it doesn't. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. There's still some restoration going on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not like an airline where you hear the noise and the, you know. Well, th this was a different technology. It was a different era. So my living area is back here. You know, the kitchen is just an ad hoc assembly of whatever structures were available at the time. This is from um, an airline, right? A food cart? Yeah, yeah, 727 food cart filled with food. More food down here and rice and energy bars, distilled water. The things you would need if there were a big earthquake and you just couldn't get anything. Even in my depleted state, I think I'd be okay here for at least two months. I haven't, I haven't been to a grocery store for a month or so. Is it hard to find a cooker? Yeah, yeah, I, I was really lucky to get that. It's in very good condition, which is unusual for a death camp food cart. So is that your bed? Yeah, this is a futon sofa which folds down flat. And that's your closet? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is this your sink and, and kitchen area or what's this? Yeah, your... you know, this is temporary, but yeah, this, this is where I brush my teeth and, and this is where I wash dishes as well. Oh. You know, hot water is... Um, that... this, this is my shower. Yep, it's very primitive. So I got it to this point and my intention was to just finish it. However, once it became functional, I had bigger things to do. I had more important things to yeah. do and I've become comfortable with it. So you have all the seats still, or not all, but some. Uh, some. And it's possible that Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis Fanny was right here. <laughs> Why is that? Aristotle Onassis' last flight was in this bird. He was in the aft cargo compartment in his box. He died in Paris, and he was flown back to Greece for burial in this aircraft. And the Kennedy entourage flew in the aircraft accompanying him back to Greece. I never wanted debt, so it wasn't important to me to have a nice home when I was young, and so I didn't want to shoulder a mortgage. Instead, the strategy was to simply accumulate oh. funds until I could cash out on a home. By the time I had done that, to be able to simply buy a home with cash, I was not feeling so constrained about what choices to make. I started thinking more like an engineer, started thinking about the materials, the technology, and also which is the most fun. I've spent more time here recently as I add power conversion for additional utility. In this era, 
integrated circuits were rather simple and and low in performance and capability um, there were still I think a few vacuum tubes so the electronics bay was relatively large the amount of cables and complexity is just overwhelming yeah yeah they're they're um, hundreds of kilometers of wire hundreds of kilometers well hundreds of kilometers yeah maybe not hundreds of kilometers that might be a little yeah and they're at least kilometers it looks like a nervous system of a, of a living uh, organism yeah it does doesn't it and each of these wires has a unique serial number they're all different so if you're patient you can trace a wire from here yes and the aft end of the aircraft by looking for the same serial number wow. although I typically use a sniffer a device which attaches on one end and then I can hear it these are power cables so there are three engines of course and each one provides three phase power so there's heavy copper uh, power cables from the engines, all three of them, so a total of nine of those, and I'll be leveraging those. I'll use one for five volt power, for five and a quarter volt for a common computer devices, another for 13.6 volt power. That's for a lot of the LED lighting and other devices. And flight deck. Okay, so this is an old flight deck, required a three person crew. So this is the captain's chair, of course, first officer, and for this bird, a flight engineer. Was that? This is not native. Okay, but um, it was just something you put in there then. Yeah, okay. yeah the, all of this was completely stripped. It was completely skeletonized. The, all the racks were completely empty when I acquired the aircraft. And, and so I'll, I'll add um, tablet computers and displays and so on to give it some functional looking characteristics. All the walls are removed, they've all been pressure washed, and they'll all be reattached when I finished all my electrical work. So it looks ragged right now. It looks, you know, it, it, it's, it's got that World War II bomber kind of look to it. You know, the, the, this project is 17 years into the work and it's still ongoing. So you just bought this? Yeah, you know, there was no instruction guide except that an inspiring gal named Joanne Usery had done this before, and it only cost $4,000 if I remember correctly. I paid $100,000 for mine with the contractor, the salvage company, but it didn't work out well. I paid $100,000, and I later learned that you can acquire aircraft fully operational for about that price. My recommendation is call the airlines directly. You know, they're just used cars to them and then they, they need to sell them for the best price they can get, and they will sell them to anyone who has the money and has their logistics well-ordered. So you, w w once you purchase the aircraft, you've got to have a ferry pilot ready and the fuel ready and get it out of there because the airline doesn't want to, to deal with it on their space. It's expensive. And so you put it up on blocks. Well, th these are temporary. So this is a temporary support structure, and I will raise this another maybe 20 or 30 centimeters, and then remove all of this material, possibly retract the nose gear, or possibly simply compress the strut, depending on how much room we want underneath as we work. And then we'll pour a concrete pad, and then fabricate a concrete pillar sewer conduit there is a plan of course to apply more dirt so this will be covered and left gear this is electrical and portable water and they connect to the aircraft at the natural service door for water using the normal boeing ramp connectors so it's just a quarter turn connector you just twist it on it's done it doesn't leak it's robust incredibly convenient to attach and, and service if it ever needs it although it never has they're coiled so the aircraft can wander during an earthquake. The coils are held in place by C-clamps, so they have an open side and they just pop off and the coils unfurl when there's force pulling on, on any of the conduits. Right gear, you can see the struts are inflated and I keep them inflated so that when an earthquake happens, you know, right now I'm vulnerable because the aircraft can wander off the pillars and so the struts are fully inflated to give this. A strut is a hydraulic cushion device. So when aircraft land, these compress to soften the blow. And they can compress all the way down to the bottom of the shiny area. Okay. 
So right now they're fully inflated. Those, those wheels, are they in good shape? They look like... Yeah, they, they just, they've been sitting there for 17 years. I've never inflated any of them, but yeah, they've done well. They're out of the sunshine. My guess is they'll last a long time. Outboard aileron, outboard flaps. They are rigged and you can walk on them, but be careful because they can be slick. Spoilers, these destroy lift from the wing. As you can see, I need to wash underneath. That's on my agenda, but it's not a high priority right now. Inboard flaps. How did you get this here? Well, a house mover moved it. So you had to disassemble? Well, we cut the wing right here. The, these are not native bolts. These are splice bolts, which I added. The idea is to weld this eventually to reestablish the integrity of the wing. So um, you cut the wings off. Anything else have to come apart? The tail. And you can see, now the, the forward portion of the number two engine nacelle assembly is a composite, a honeycomb composite material, and it disassembles rather easily. And we did disassemble it and, and took it off. What's the year of... Uh... This is 1969. When Neil Armstrong said, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind, this bird entered service. So this is pre-1969 technology. Oh, and forward lav. This lav is not connected because the sewer discharge connector is essentially at the nose of the aircraft. And the nose of the aircraft is quite high off the ground. If I plumb this one, it'll be pretty unsightly from the outside. Okay. This is called the snake pit by the service guys. It's the climate control bay. That's the native water tank. And you can see some condensation on the outside. That's the 13 degrees C temperature of the water revealing itself. That's a dehydrator. That's not Boeing equipment. <laughs> and it's aircraft or sealed pressure canisters. You have to dehydrate. You, you don't have a choice. Human activity creates moisture. This PEX plumbing is an addition, so that this eventually goes to the shower and the clothes washer. It also goes outside to a uh, water connection in the right uh, landing gear bay. The green one is um, air. That, that's an air conduit. So the, this bay is for climate control, infrastructure, and water infrastructure. And the water is here because we're near the center of lift of the aircraft. It's as far aft as it can be without interfering with the center fuel tank. Th this is the center fuel tank. So the area below that white panel was full of gas, <laughs> as were the wings. Where did you get your technical information related to Boeing technology? I was very fortunate to be loaned a training manual for Delta Airline pilots who were training for the 727. It's for pilots and flight engineers, and it includes schematics. Some of the schematics are simplified, but not too much. As a matter of troubleshooting or enhancing systems, these are more than complete enough for me. So this is a rich source of information. It's, it's been invaluable to me. I spent a lot of time in this section as I restore the lighting systems, breakers and relays and actual illumination devices, incandescent bulbs, control panels, and I refer to this a lot. And this helps me to restore systems and also to modify systems to more modern technology. You know, my hope is that training manuals such as this are never discarded, although they probably are. But it's a shame because they're invaluable for people like me. They worked really hard to create these aircraft. You know, they, they were working with a more primitive technology compared to what we have now. Yeah. Is this a car radiator? Yes, that's from a Mazda RX-7. And this is my heat exchanger. This I built within just the last two weeks. This is attached to my normal water system. My water comes from a well, which is just alongside the tail of the aircraft. The water temperature is 13 degrees centigrade all the time. The coldest frozen day of the winter, it's 13 degrees centigrade. The hottest sweltering day of summer, it's 13 degrees centigrade. So it's a great source or sink of heat. So the 13 degrees centigrade well water flows through the heat exchanger. I suspect this might be good enough to cool the entire aircraft even on the hottest day. I'm, I'm a nerd, I'm an electrical engineer, I don't cook. <laughs> so I nuke things, 
or in very, very rare occasions, I toaster oven things and I eat popcorn. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I, th this is my kitchen, that's it. Th this is my roughly five decade old refrigerator, which wow. is almost empty. I desperately need to go to town and get, <laughs> get provisions, but it works. And I measured the power consumption. A friend said, Bruce, get a new refrigerator. It's a power hog. You're paying more money than if you bought a new refrigerator. So, okay, I put a meter, a power consumption and accumulation meter on the fridge and I measured the energy consumption. And then I went to appliance dealers and looked at all the energy saver tags and the very, very best one was the same as this. So it's old, but it's, it's a frost refrigerator. You, you have to defrost it from time to time. And wing exit. <laughs> I got a, an emergency exit row once and the flight attendant walked up to the row and said, do you all feel capable of doing this? My seatmate said yes and my other seatmate said yes and I said yes, I've done it thousands of times. That was a mistake. <laughs> so I, I, I was instantly a nutcase. I've never, I've never done that since. Grab here, pull there and out it comes.